Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming and checking out my virtual presentation. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it in person for the practicum or the program review this year, not practicum. Um, but I'm really excited to get the opportunity to talk about my dissertation research with you all today, um, where I studied the evolution of homologous recombination rates across bacterial species. Um, please reach out to me through email. I've got it here. And on the last slide, um, if you'd like to talk about any of this project or anything else, I'd love to hear from you. So just as a quick refresher, um, sexual models of evolution, we've got eukaryotes, um, which you are a eukaryote, right? Uh, we, we've got these uh, fusions of gametes that occur and we get this uh, chromosomal crossover. And then we end up with daughter cells that look genetically distinct from the parents. So that's a sexual mode of evolution, right? Where we've got some genetic change being imparted on which selection can act. And, you know, they'll go on to reproduce and produce successful offspring if those were good changes, positive changes, or even neutral changes. Bacteria, on the other hand, they reproduce by binary fission, which just means that they produce identical copies of themselves. And so for a long time, it was thought that the only way that bacteria could evolve and change would be to acquire a random mutation and then pass that on to their progeny. And so through enough evolutionary time, we get enough of these mutations and we end up with a diverse enough population to consider this a new species. Um, and so that is, in essence, sort of a clonal model of evolution where we've just got these random changes that are contributing to the diversity that we see in bacteria today, which seems a little bit far-fetched considering bacteria are super, super, super genetically diverse. So we now know um, bacteria are also capable of lateral genetic transfer. And so this is any type of gene transfer that's occurring outside of this sort of contemporary parent to offspring model of inheritance. And so here we've got heritable change being imparted. So if I transfer this allele, it, you know, the mutation occurred in this one line, this allele now can transfer to sister cells. Um, so cells existing in the same time frame, um, and then be passed on to their progeny as well. And so, um, Lateral genetic transfer is generally typified into either homologous recombination or horizontal gene transfer. Horizontal gene transfer is what most of us are probably a bit more familiar with. Um, these are transfers of large gene or multi-gene fragments that can really occur without a lot of boundary um, between species, genera, uh, phyla, uh, kingdoms even, um, because they don't have this requisite of homology or sameness um, in the DNA sequences that are being exchanged. So as an example of this, I've got this donor sequence of genes. It's coming from somewhere. Uh, I've got an acceptor genome just kind of shown in part here. And if I insert this donor sequence of genes, it's recombining um, through horizontal gene transfer. Uh, we end up with this recombined genome that looks really, really different than the acceptor genome it started as. So this is pretty easy to point out if I'm looking at a large number of bacterial sequences aligned and like two of them have this huge segment of genes and the others don't. It's pretty easy for me to say, okay, that probably came from a horizontal gene transfer event. It's probably didn't evolve de novo um, just in these couple of strains. That really wouldn't make a lot of sense. Homologous recombination, on the other hand, is a little trickier to identify. So here we've got a really high level of DNA identity between strands that are being exchanged. So 95%. So that's 95% similarity between those individual nucleotide sites. These are really small exchanges. And because we've got this requisite of homology, this type of exchange is occurring primarily within the spe same species. And so what we generally do is quantify this exchange um, via R over M or recombination rate, um, which is a measurement of the number of changes imparted by recombination versus the number of changes imparted by mutation to a DNA sequence. So R recombination over mutation. And so an example of this occurring here is we've got this donor sequence of just nucleotide sites 
um, and an acceptor genome. And so the only evidence of this whole sequence being exchanged is these couple of polymorphisms or difference that we get from the acceptor genome. So unfortunately, if I'm just looking at this sequence and it's compared to a lot of others, um, these changes could very, very easily be from mutation alone. Um, it's really hard to know where the boundaries of this transfer event are. So how much of this sequence has been exchanged by recombination. Um, it could be very possible that each one of these polymorphisms was from a separate mutation event. Um, maybe only half the sequence because the polymorphisms are clustered. We might assume that that would be more likely transferred from recombination. But overall, it's just really hard to tell. So I study homologous recombination, and that's mostly going to be occurring, again, within a species and within the core genome of that species. So if I have three different strains here, strain A lives in the dirt, Strain B lives in the gut and strain C also lives in the gut, but maybe makes it not that happy. If I represent strain A genes as a circle, same with strain B and strain C genes, the core genome would be the set of genes that's shared by all individuals within that species. Whereas the accessory genome is all of that extra stuff that really kind of allows them to live in different environments, really represents the stuff that's going to be horizontally transferred. So we're looking at, when looking at homologous recombination, specifically within the core genome, just within that set of genes that's shared by all individuals. So for this analysis, we are looking at 162 um, bacterial species. And within each of those species, we have between 15 to 100 um, genomes within the analysis. So our big evolutionary question for this study is whether or not mutation or lateral genetic transfer is a bigger driver of bacterial evolution. You know, can we consider bacteria to be truly clonally evolving as their mode of reproduction might suggest? Or is this DNA transfer more akin to sort of this quasi-sexual mode of evolution? So what's imparting more diversity? Um, is it mutation or homologous recombination? And do we see differences between different species, genera, et cetera? And if so, how has this trait evolved and what factors might be impacting some of these differences that we see between different taxa? So what we developed was a novel method for inferring homologous recombination rates using approximate Bayesian computation. So as I said, it's really hard to identify signatures of homologous recombination using real sequence data. And so what we're doing is we're using forward in time simulations to simulate evolution with a given recombination rate. And so the idea here is we've got the sequence, it can evolve under these different recombination rates, and ultimately we'll end up with a population of genomes which lo should look similar to the real population, assuming we evolved it under a similar recombination rate simple enough. Um, so we do this 500,000 times for each species. So altogether over the 163 species or so that we've got, um, we end up with, I don't know, something like 80 million simulations is a lot. It was like four years of simulating. It was, it was a lot. <laughs> um, but um, what we can do with this, it's, it's really cool, is we can start comparing each of these sets of 500,000 simulations per species to generate this posterior data set um, using a number of summary statistics of simulations that have populations that look really, really similar to our real species population. And so we can infer then that that simulated population evolved under a very similar recombination rate as our real species population. So. Very nice. So we did this for 162 bacteria and one archaea, um, and we found that homologous recombination rate does vary tremendously amongst bacteria species. Um, from this graph, you can see that some species, let me find the laser pointer, over here on the right end, recombine, uh, have a recombination rate of less than one. So that indicates that we've got more diversity being imparted by mutation than recombination. So these species should probably still be considered pretty clonal. Um, way on the other end of the spectrum, we have 30 times the amount of polymorphisms being imparted by DNA exchange versus mutation alone. 
And on average, we see a recombination rate of about six across all species. So mapping this trait on the phylogeny of bacterial evolution, um, we get this much larger picture of how this trait relates across bacteria species as a whole and how they've evolved for um, streptococcus species. Um, so all of these in here in this clade represent you know, all members of streptococcus in this study, um, et cetera, moving through the tree. Um, so Streptococcus has very high rates of recombination across um, the individuals in, in its uh, genera, whereas we have other um, genuses like Staphylococcus genera, like Staphylococcus, um, which have much lower rates of recombination. And these traits tend to be relatively or more than we'd expect to be um, just by chance sort of conserved within these genus, which is really interesting. Um, what was especially interesting was we saw that um, obligate endosymbionts like chlamydia, um, which co which require residing inside of a host cell um, to survive, um, have a really low rate of recombination, which makes sense because those individuals, because they exist inside a host cell, are less likely to be coming in contact with um, conspecific individuals that they could exchange DNA with. So our big question for this analysis was whether or not mutation or lateral genetic transfer was a bigger driver of bacterial evolution. And so we asked what was imparting more diversity? Was it mutation or homologous recombination? And we found that homologous recombination as a whole contributes about six times more diversity than mutation alone. And we asked also whether this relationship was different amongst different species. And we found that, yeah, it varies tremendously from a recombination rate of less than one. So clonal species to highly recombining species um, at 30 times the diversity being imparted by homologous recombination versus mutation. And we asked a little bit, um, you can definitely read more about this in the paper, um, but how has this trait evolved and what factors might be impacting its evolution? And we saw evidence for evolutionary conservation of this trait of recombination rate um, at the genus level. So similar species had a similar recombination rate, um, indicating that recombination rate itself is likely an evolvable trait. Um, limited data is supporting that recombination um, rate is also impacted by the likelihood of interaction with variant cells of the same species. And so um, for this question, so lateral genetic transfer does seem to be the winner here um, in contributing the most diversity to bacterial evolution. And so cool, um, what do we do with this information? Um, we get to update current models of evolution. So we largely assume across a lot of different experiments that bacteria are clonal. They're staying the same through multiple generations um, with the exception of a couple kind of errant mutations here and there, but that's really not true. Um, they're capable of exchanging genetic information and they do so frequently even in very similar populations. And so really we need to consider bacteria to be a population of, I'm sorry, a collection of unique individuals within a population, not necessarily clones. Um, and so updating these models of evolution allows us to ultimately enhance the prediction of things like antimicrobial resistance and spread, um, pathogenicity and disease in these different um, bacteria and the people they infect as well as the changes that bacteria will go through and how quickly these changes will occur in response to things like environmental stresses or a changing climate. And so with that, I'd just like to quickly thank my research advisor, Dr. Louis-Marie Babet, as well as the co-authors on this project, Dr. Awa Diop and Corey Burton as well as thank my practicum advisor, Dr. Simon Rue. I was at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, so please reach out if you'd like to chat about that. I highly recommend working with Dr. Rue or Dr. Janelle Basso on um, viruses, if you're interested in that sort of thing in the sequence analysis of viruses. They do really, really cool work. It was, it was a lot of fun. And of course, thank you to the CSGF for affording me all of these opportunities to do really cool research during my dissertation. So thank you so much for listening. Um, 
Have a great day.